Hello and welcome to the Awards and Personalization Association's The Do's and Don'ts of Logos, Art, Copyrights, and Trademarks webinar. Today's presentation will be worth 0.1 CEU credits. To start off, we have a few reminders. All attendees are in listen-only mode. If during the presentation you have any questions or difficulties, please use the Q&A function in your menu options to alert us or email Sarah Detloff at S-D-E-T-H-L-O-F-F -F at awardspersonalization.org. We will be answering all questions at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to submit them as the presentation is running. Today's webinar is being recorded. A link will be posted on the webinar library after the presentation is completed. After the webinar is over, please complete the survey you received via email. We love to receive any and all feedback. For those of you who are not members of the association, welcome. We encourage you to register for all of the upcoming webinars and invite your staff to do the same. The association is dedicated to helping your business thrive. When the time comes, join and take advantage of all the resources the association has to offer. You will view the member benefits on our website today. As a reminder, please review the association's antitrust policy and keep it in mind when asking questions or sharing comments. Our presenter today is Michael B. Stewart. Michael is a founding member of the firm Fishman Stewart Intellectual Property. He has worked in a wide range of technical areas, including information technology, e-commerce, telecommunications, and mechanical, aerospace, computer, and nuclear engineering. In addition, Michael has substantial experience managing, administering, and conducting worldwide projects involving updating ownership records of large intellectual property portfolios. Michael's breadth of experience has enabled him to apply a comprehensive cross-disciplinary approach to maximize the scope of intellectual property protection and beneficial usage. Prior to practicing law, Michael was an engineer for a major automotive OEM and a systems manager engineer for the Computer Aided Engineering Network for the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan. Michael has been recognized by the State Bar of Michigan's A Lawyer Help Program for giving back to the community. And with that, we will turn it over to you, Michael. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone for joining us today for talking about the do's and do nots of logos, art, copyrights, and trademarks. What I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be giving you an overview of intellectual property and the protection of creativity. I'll be spending just a couple of minutes talking about patents, but most of my time today will be talking about trademarks, copyrights, and a little bit about rights of publicity. And then I'm going to give you some scenarios to help us uh, learn some of the issues that can be associated uh, with you in the awards and personalization industry. Also, at the end of the presentation, uh, you're going to be getting some information on a possible agreement uh, that you can use or to make modifications to that I'm calling an artisan agreement. And if you send me an email, I'd be glad to send you a copy of the agreement in Word uh, format so you can take a look at it and format it for your usage. So let's go ahead and get started. So what is intellectual property? Intellectual property is a product of the mind and human intellect. It's something we call unreal property. And it's based on the United States Constitution. The Constitution states that the Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the different states. And then it also talks about promoting the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. There are several basic types of intellectual property. When the idea is put to practical use, it can be the subject of a patent. When a new idea is first created, but before it's disclosed to others, it's considered a trade secret. When the idea is fixed in a tangible form, it is subject to copyright. We're gonna be talking about another form of intellectual property that's been created through case law and some of the legislative intent for different states. Um, and that's gonna be talking about trademarks first, and then we're gonna mention a little bit about rights of publicity. First, when a service or product is sold, the name under which it's sold becomes a trademark. And we also have the idea that you have the right to protect your privacy and your right to publicity. So why should you care? Properly and securing monetizing intellectual property maximizes enterprise value. This is important to you because owners are motivated to enforce their intellectual property rights. And if you violate those rights, they have an incentive to come after you to protect their intellectual property and to seek redress and monetary damages from you. Patents give exclusivity for up to 20 years, 
and in some cases it may be between 15 and 20 years. Trade secrets can last forever. Trademarks can propagate a brand and may last forever. And copyrights grant exclusive rights to an original work. So what are some IP examples? Utility patents protect useful products, processes, or machines. Design patents protect the ornamental features for devices and user interfaces. Trade secrets protect secret information such as contact lists, marketing and business strategies, and some things like pricing and discount information. Trademarks are source identifications of products and services. And as I mentioned earlier, copyrights protect the tangible expression of an idea. And rights of publicity protect one's rights to the commercial exploitation or not of a person's name, image, likeness, or other identifying indicia. So let's start with patents. A patent gives an inventor the right to exclusive use of their invention for a limited period of time. It's generally 20 years from the filing of a utility application and 15 years from the issuance of a design application or a design patent. So what does a patent do? It allows the owner to prevent others from making, using, selling, or offering to sell, or importing devices that are covered by the patent. Significantly, it does not give the patent owner the right to make, use, or sell their own invention. You have a situation sometimes where someone comes up with an improvement, but the basic concept is covered by another patent. So in your industry, what is an example of a utility patent? This is an example of a utility patent to a threadable heat transfer press with a heat lower platen. Here's an example of a design patent covering a trophy. And that just protects the ornamental features of the uh, trophy itself. And here's an example of another design patent to another trophy. So let's turn now to trademarks. Trademarks protect any word, name, symbol, or device, or any combination thereof used to identify and distinguish goods and services and to indicate their source. And if you look at this slide, here are some examples of some Coca-Cola trademarks. They have it to the script Coca-Cola, they have it to Coke by itself, and they even have protection to bottle designs, not only to glass bottles, but here to an aluminum bottle shape. So let's talk about trademark basics. Typically, you protect brand names and logos used on goods and services through trademark protection. A registration symbol, the R in the circle, can last indefinitely as long as you pay and you do the maintenance required to file and maintain the information with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. When you do have a federal registration, you get a 10-year term and you have renewal every 10 years. So what are the functions of a trademark? It indicates the source of origin of goods or services. It helps to guarantee the quality of goods bearing the mark. It creates and maintains a demand for the product, and it's used as a marketing tool to build a brand. And in many organizations, the trademarks are of significant monetary value to the organization. So how does one protect a trademark? Trademarks are protected under federal and state law. They're earned, not born. That means they come into being through actual use not just through the registration process. So you can actually, through your business, infringe what's known as a common law trademark, even if there's not a federal registration. There are advantages, however, to having a federal registration. This gives constructive notice to the public of your claim of ownership of the mark if you're the owner. And it also gives notice of an exclusive right to use the mark nationwide in or in connection with goods or services that are covered by the registration. So here's an example of some trademarks used to identify goods. Xerox, Kleenex brand tissue, Kodak in association with film. Here's some examples of service marks to identify services. FedEx, MTV for music television, and also the Awards and Personalization Association. I'm gonna be talking about what are called bugs, the R in the circle a little bit later. But for the members of the Awards and Personalization Association on the webinar today, I noticed on your website, you do not have an R in a circle. And when I saw you were missing that, I decided to see if you in fact have a federal registration, and you do.
I see it was registered in 2017. Interestingly, your registration is covering both the logo and the words, and you're also protecting the colors at the same time. And there is a possibility you might be able to get broader protection, but I recommend that for the association as well, you use the R in the circle in prominent locations where you're telling people about your organization. So let's talk for just a minute about word marks and logos. AT&T is a registered mark. Many of you also know about the globe, and when you see the globe, you associate it with AT&T. We have NBC, which is a registered mark, and we also have the Peacock logo, and when people see the Peacock logo, they again think of NBC. In your industry, one of the companies is called Transfer Express. They have both a logo and they also have protection of Transfer Express as a registered trademark. So, I'm, this is my first question and answer for you. Here is a complete advertisement that is shown in a magazine. What is the logo that is being advertised? And if you're able to bring up and do a chat, uh, or in your case, a question or answer, can someone tell me what the logo is shown in this picture? It's a heart, that's correct. But inside there is a logo on one of the pieces of chocolate. Does anyone see that? Yes. Good job, it's Chris, it was Mercedes, excellent. Yep, and if we look here, you can see you have the Mercedes symbol. That tells you about the power of a brand, that looking at all these shapes, you're able to tell that that's the Mercedes symbol. Slogans are also protected. Here's an example of a number of different slogans that we see in advertising. Just do it, life's good, it's springy looking good, and nothing runs like a deer. Sound marks are also able to be protected. And I'm gonna play a couple of them for you right now. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it because I'm having to do it through my microphone. But let's talk about the NBC. Sorry about that. So there's an example of the bong. Here's the lion's roar for MGM. And finally, who would have thought that the Tarzan yell would be a registered mark? So there we go. You can even protect color as a registered trademark. And that's gonna be very important when we show some examples a little bit later. And that's an area where people in your industry get into some trouble. We have red by Johnny Walker. And if you look at the advertisement, it says red stands out when friends drop in. Yellow by Cuddy Sark, another alcohol brand. Even the color of the label separates Cuddy Sark from the rest. Pink by Owens Corning. Not only do you get the pink in the fiberglass itself, but they are really aggressive about uh, advertising the pink uh, in their different marketing. We talk about pink is green, think pink, if rising fuel costs make you blue, think pink again. So they very much advertise the color pink in their marketing materials. And of course, I assume all of you know about Tiffany Blue. And when you see that box, you immediately think of Tiffany. And that as well is a registered trademark. The key point though, is that you only have trademark protection to the goods or services that are appropriate in a registration and if you use it for something else that's not within those goods or services, you don't have an issue. This means, for example, if you wanna paint your house this Robin's egg blue, you're not gonna have a trademark infringement. It's only when you're using it for the goods for which Tiffany has protection. 3D configurations is another area where you can get trademark protection. I've already mentioned the Coca-Cola bottle. Mrs. Butterworth's is protected in terms of the shape of her bottle and also the Rolls Royce uh, Chevron that you can see in the picture before you. And very rarely, but every once in a while, you even can get a building protected. And the Transamerica building is protected by a registered trademark. There are even some fragrance marks, very few of them, but it turns out Verizon has a registered trademark for its flowery musk scent. And Play-Doh 
also has a federal registration for the distinctive smell when you open its canisters. It's very important to realize that you can even get trademark protection for single letters. Here's one example for a hotel for W. I live in Michigan, so Western Michigan University has a trademark registration to its W. And here's an example of a federal trademark registration for artist supplies. This is from Adams Creative Products. I mentioned earlier bugs. And bugs are the things that are associated with the actual trademark to help identify and tell the consuming public that you're claiming trademark or service mark rights to it. You use a TM for unregistered trademarks, you use an SM for registered service marks, and you can only use an R in a circle if you have a registered mark. So let's talk about blood or bug placement. Vlasic is showing it here on the right-hand side. Anchemino is an example of another registered mark, and they're showing it at the left-hand side. And Stalls is showing it on the right-hand side. If you're given a project where you're asked to use something where there is the R in the circle, I recommend that you include it in your work product, even if it's hard to read. The R in the circle is very important to the trademark owner in a way of informing everybody that they in fact have a registered trademark. So we encourage that you do use it whenever possible. It's not essential that you always use it, but we recommend that you use it when you can. And here's an example for Pepsi Cola, where they put the R in the circle in the middle of the mark for Pepsi and Pepsi Cola. So let me give you a quick pop quiz. Do you have to follow a US application before you can use the unregistered notices TM and SM? Does someone want to try to answer that question? Yes, correct, the answer is no. Thank you very much. Filing a US trademark or service mark application is not a condition to use a trademark or service mark notice. You should use a TM and SM with unregistered marks regardless of whether or not there's a US application or not. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a gotcha for artisans like you. You can even have trademark protection if you don't have the R in the circle showing, if you don't have a TM or an SM. All it has to be is source identifying, so be careful. Now, one of the reasons why some companies are so aggressive about protecting their trademarks is that they're worried about what's called genericide. And genericide is where there's a loss of rights when a mark becomes a common descriptive name for a product or service. It re results from repeated use of a mark as a noun by the trademark owner, the industry, or the consumer public. So here are some examples of former trademarks that have become generic terms. Thermos, aspirin, trampoline, escalator, zipper, and kerosene. Here are some companies that I think have danger of losing their trademarks. Xerox, Kleenex, Jell-O, Q-Tip, Band-Aid, Popsicle, and Rollerblade. So that's sometimes why some of these companies are very aggressive at going after artisans because they're trying to do everything they can to protect their brands. Johnson & Johnson is a perfect example of the situation. They used to cause themselves some problem they had a series of commercials which said, I'm stuck on Band-Aids because Band-Aids are stuck on me. And now they have a modified commercial that says, I'm stuck on Band-Aid brand because Band-Aids are stuck on me. And I'm actually gonna show you this commercial. It's about 30 seconds. And the reason why I'm showing it in part is because it's gonna prove the point of trying to avoid genericide. But I'm also kind of interested in this commercial because of their use of fonts. You'll see what I mean. So let me try this. Oops, sorry, let me try this again. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna go back. 
go ahead and stop it there, but you get the idea of what they're trying to do to build brand awareness of efforts. Here's some other examples, Xerox. You can photocopy, or you can photocopy, but you can Xerox. And here they're talking about protecting their brand. And here's one regarding aspirin, because we mentioned earlier that aspirin had lost its trademark. And here it says, when you use Xerox the way you use aspirin, we get a headache. So again, use the word photocopy. So going to trademarks now, if there is a violation, what kind of damages are available? The trademark owner can get actual damages incurred from someone infringing it. They can get your profits. They can get treble recovery and even higher if there's willful infringement, meaning you know you're violating the brand or the trademark and you continue to do it. And they can even get attorney's fees and costs if there's willful infringement. So you wanna be very careful. So let's put it all together. Here are three shirt designs and are they gonna cause you trouble? Let's take the one on the left, Who Dat Nation. Who Dat is a registered trademark by the St. Orleans Saints and it uses well-known team colors. So you may have trademark issues both because of the color and also because you're using a registered trademark. What about the one in the middle here? Orange and blue through and through. It uses the Bronco logo and well-known colors of the team. What about San Francisco World Series champions with a number of years? World Series is a registered trademark referring to um, a registered trademark referring to the San Francisco Giants and it uses well-known team colors. So all three of these examples could cause you some issues if you're using them when you're doing some of the stuff through your personalization. You wanna be very careful again. So now let's turn to copyright. Copyright protects an author's original expression that is fixed in a tangible media. It protects his artwork things, musical scores, sculptures, software codes, basically anything that you can put into a tangible form that has originality. Copyright exists as soon as it's created. Registration is not required. And at the very least, if it's done by an individual, the term is an author's life plus 70 years. And the copyright system is administered by the Library of Congress. I mentioned earlier about originality. Copyright requires originality, but originality is very liberally interpreted. It only needs to originate from the author and not be copied from another's work. There is infringement if it's copied from another person's work and you don't have one of the exceptions called fair use. I'll come back to fair use in just a couple of minutes. So typically how are copyrights identified in a work? It's optional to have a copyright registration, not registration, but they see in the symbol that we talk about when you look at a copyrighted thing, you're not required to have it, it's encouraged. But we encourage people to do the copyright symbol because it puts people on notice that you're asserting your copyright against third parties. There are three elements when you do use a copyright uh, symbol. You can have the symbol, the copyright with the C, or spell it out, whatever makes sense to you. We usually recommend that you have the year when it was first published and the name of the copyright owner. But again, this is optional. It's not a legal requirement, so you wanna be careful as an artisan. There are statutory advantages to getting a registration. It helps you with resumption of ownership and statutory damages. And it's also a prerequisite to filing suit against an alleged infringer. If you yourself have come up with a really nice design or something that you think that other people are going to basically rip off, you might wanna register your own designs. And we recommend that you do it within three months of first publication to preserve your rights. You do not need an attorney to file a copyright registration application. It's very simple. And the Copyright Office gives good, excuse me, gives good guidance. You can go to copyright.gov for more information, including application forms. One of the biggest issues in your industry are derivative works. Derivative works are works that are based on one or more pre-existing works. A derivative work covers any other form in which a work can be recast transformed or adapted. Copyright protection in a derivative work extends only to that contributed by the author of the derivative work, not to the pre-existing work on which it is based. Copyright of pre-existing work does not affect, or excuse me, copyright of the original work 
does, is not affected by the copyright to the derivative work. So let's look here at Thanksgiving 2015, the Mickey logo with a hat on it. So the original copyrighted work by Disney is to the three circles, which is associated with Mickey Mouse. You may have added the Thanksgiving 2015 with a hat. That would be considered a derivative work. And as we'll talk about earlier, this is probably an infringement of, co uh, of Disney's copyright and it can cause you issues. Now there are a number of defenses if someone is found to infringe a copyright. You're allowed to use uh, someone else's copyrighted work if you're gonna be criticizing it, commentary typically associated with parody, factual news reporting, and teaching. So some of the materials I'm showing you today, I'm able to use with fair use because I'm educating you. You wanna be very careful as an artisan not to rely on fair use exceptions. It's better generally if you refuse to print the derivative work, because if you do get caught, the damages can be substantial. So there are some misconceptions that I typically get when people talk to me about copyrights. Some people say it's the amount of copying that you do that is relevant. It turns out the percentage of copying is irrelevant and people can get in trouble for taking a very small part of a copyrighted work, particularly if it's an important part of the work that kind of captures the entire expression. I mentioned earlier that copyright is, exists as soon as it's created. Identification is not required. You can infringe a non-registered work. I see all the time people will take logos and pictures from the internet, put them on shirts, put them on pants, put them on wood, and think that they're fine because they downloaded it from the internet. No, you can still get in a lot of trouble for that. And there are companies out there that will scour the internet and look for pictures and things like that of derivative works and go after those individuals. Moreover, a copyrighted work is still protected even if it's not being actively used. Something can be put in storage for years and then brought back out, it is still a copyrighted protected expression. So I mentioned earlier about derivative works and I don't think I'm gonna repeat it here. So let's talk about copyright damages. You have actual damages at the very least it's the dollar amount of any demonstrable loss of the copyright owner or to the copyright owner. You can get profits, which is the money made by the infringer as a result of infringement. And probably one of the strongest way to get damages for register mark are statutory damages. They can be high as $150,000 for a single infringement if it's willful, but even if it's not willful, the damages start at $750 a piece and go up to $30,000. And on top of that, the copyright owner can recover attorney's fees under some circumstances. To tell you how lucrative that this is for copyright owners, let's leave this industry and let's go to the music industry. When I was a young associate many years ago, I would be sent into bars and I would listen to songs that we played over the um, musical system or over the uh, public announcement system. And I would record the songs, the authors, and the actual music itself in the time. And then I would go back to the office and see if that organization or that bar had a license. And if they didn't have a license, we would send them a cease and desist letter asking for tens of thousands of dollars. This would be done through BMI or ASCAP. And then we'd reach settlements of them uh, where they wouldn't have to pay all the money, but they would have to pay substantial money and then to take a license so that they could play the music in their bar. And it's exactly the same thing in your industry. So now let's put it all together. On my left is a photograph that was taken by uh, a photographer in 1985. And on the right is a derivative work done by two individuals. Is this gonna be a copyright infringement or not? Does someone wanna speak up on that? Is that gonna be a plagiarism or is that gonna be an infringement? It was held to be an infringement. So the derivative work that was made on the right-hand side was found to infringe the copyrighted activity on the left-hand side. What about this one? You have Barack Obama on the left and then a poster design that was done. Is that 
a derivative work, and is that going to be a possible copyright infringement? In this case, they did not actually go to trial, but the argument was made that it was fair use, and then the owner of the photograph charged that there was infringement, and the parties did reach a settlement uh, outside of court. But I would argue that it probably was not fair use because money was being made, and it was more like a copyright infringement. Let's look at this one, and I can see this happening to any artisan. We have on the left a modern dog illustration from 2008, and then Target used parts of that picture on a t-shirt design with a heart. Is that gonna be an infringement as a derivative work? It was held to be a copyright infringement of the illustration. And finally, for those of you working in jewelry and that type of industry, we have on the left the original piece of jewelry, and then we have a nasty girl necklace on the right. The lawsuit was settled on the eve of trial, and the nasty girl ended up declaring bankruptcy less than a year later. The settlement is very confidential, but my understanding is that there was a lot of money that was paid from nasty girl to Jamie Spinello. So it turns out there's an industry here uh, for going after people that are infringing copyrights. And also there's a lot of resources on the internet to help protect you. On the left, I heart copyright infringement, probably done by an attorney. And then on the right hand side, copyright me, this is a blog that can give you some answers to some of the questions uh, regarding possible copyright infringement. So here are two cartoons, Modern Art School, We'll begin with the most basic figure in art, a copyright attorney. And then the honest attorney, the copyright attorney, imitation is the sincerest form of my income. Be very careful when you plagiarize or copy someone else's work, um, you can get yourself in trouble. It's better to show your own creativity and to make sure your customers bring things to you that are original versus copying someone else. So let's now briefly talk about right of publicity. Right of publicity is one's right to the commercial exploitation or not, as I mentioned earlier, of his or her name, image, likeness, or other identifying indicia. One of the Bitcoin companies decided to come out with something called Kanye West. And Kanye West was not too receptive to that. And what you're seeing in the picture in front of you is the coin they came up with. He sued them for copyright infringement and also for right of publicity, and he won. And the Bitcoin competitor ended up going away. If you have a right of publicity claim and you lose, the damages are really actual damages, the profits received by the infringer, and attorney's fees and costs in many times situations. There's sometimes an exception, but often attorney fees and costs are given. So let's put it all together. I want to get clayed, or seriously, a love Miley. I would suggest to you that both of these shirts can raise issues with respect to rights of publicity. I would argue it might also raise some trademark issues as well. So you want to be very careful. So let's talk now about what happens in real life, in the real world and real life. This is from the website of the Rotary. And I know many of you are asked to do things for organizations like Toastmasters, Rotaries, the Optimist Club, and put things on mugs and shirts, things like that. There's a real risk here. So if you go to the Rotary website, it says this. If you would like to sell or give away merchandise, and this is to their own clubs, such as t-shirts and mugs, bearing the Rotary marks, you must purchase such merchandise from an official RI, for Rotary International, licensed vendor, and then they give you a contact address if you want to get alternative permission. So when you use the Rotary mark and you're not an official RI licensed vendor, you're putting yourself at risk. Also on the website, it says any user wishing to use any of the site content in a publication or for commercial purposes, this is more on the copyright side, must request and receive prior written permission from RI, which is an RI sole discretion. And you're told if you use any of the site content, you might be an infringer of their copyrights. And then I give you the actual location where this information is present. 
let's talk briefly about Disney. Infringement of Disney marks and their copyrights is so prevalent, an organization called LegalZoom has an entire page dedicated to this issue. And if you go to the website, and I'll give you the link here, this sums it up very well. Not only does Disney hold substantial intellectual property rights in its characters, it strictly enforces those rights. A simple Google search reveals a host of lawsuits brought by Disney against those who try to use its characters' names or likenesses in infringing manners without permission. So there's a risk here. So now let me give you a pop quiz. Is there an infringement if you do the, the logo on or the artwork on the upper left-hand side called Real 2016? Correct. It's going to be an infringement. It turns out that the Olympic Circles is a registered trademark. So if you use it that way, you're actually infringing their trademark. I mentioned earlier that I live in Michigan. I'm actually in the Detroit area. So let's look at number two. I'm giving you two examples of logos that I have seen in our uh, local community. One says Detroit Pipe Fitters Local 636 with, um, needless to say, an octopus. And then the second one we have is Detroit Fitters. Technically, I would argue that both of those are going to be trademark infringements, but I think there's actually a fair use argument here. There's not going to be a likelihood of confusion, arguably, and it's more of a parody. But when I look at the Detroit Fitters, I immediately start thinking about the Detroit Pistons. So there could be confusion here. That's going to be more on the edge, and I think you want to be careful about it. But there is a possibility that you would have a fair use defense. Let's look at number three, Greece. Is that going to be an infringement? I would argue that this is going to be an infringement. You're merely looking at the movie. The movie has become so known in industry that it actually has a trademark protection to Greece itself. And if you do something like that, you might be infringing the third party trademark. And then finally, let's talk about Disney. The different examples here, even if you put them on shirts for family reunions and things like that, they do raise the risk of being an infringement and you could get challenged by Disney. That's just the reality of what can happen. So there are three takeaways that I have for you today. One, unless it's in the public domain, make sure your customers have the ownership or license to reproduce copyrighted and trademark works or images of famous people. Get that confirmation in writing. Two, tell your customers to create their own unique designs that bring a voice to their own views and don't copy someone else's, create it from scratch yourself. And then three, and maybe most importantly, put the burden on your customers to indemnify you if an infringement claim is later brought, but use common sense. What if your customer has no money, but you do, and you get sued and they have no ability to indemnify you, you're still in trouble. In short, if you suspect an issue, are you willing to take the risk? It's ultimately a business decision. Even a one-off can result in legal action, but realistically, are they going to come after you for one mug? Probably not, but the more money you make, like if you do hundreds of shirts or thousands of shirts, the higher the risk. Let's take an example that I received today from somebody where they are going to be doing shirts for a marathon, hopefully at some point later this year, who knows what will be happening with social distancing. And there's a bunch of logos on the back for the sponsors. The organizer of the marathon should be able to get from the people that are going to get recognition from them, the permission to use their logos on the shirts. And they should be able to indemnify you if you put the logos on the back. Put the burden on them. And that way, if there's one of the people that wanted to be a sponsor but did not choose to ultimately to be a sponsor, if there's an issue with it, um, if you get attacked by a lawsuit or a cease and desist letter, you can then go back to the marathon organizer and say, protect me. There is some common sense here, though, because if this is good publicity for the organizations and they're sponsoring a marathon, maybe you don't have as much risk. Again, the goal is to use common sense. I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that uh, there was a one-page artisan agreement I put together. 
If you send me an email, I'll send this to you in Word form. It's a little bit different than what you see on the screen now, but it is one page and it basically helps protect you from your customers if they're giving you something that causes you concern. So think about using it when appropriate. Okay, that's all I have for the presentation, but I wanted to leave some time for you to be able to ask questions. So I'd like to open it to the audience. If you wanna ask your questions, I will try to answer them. And I'm going to make it a little bit larger here. So if you have questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them for you. Okay, one of the questions says, with the case of President Obama poster, how can you possibly prove it is a copy of that specific photo? There must be hundreds of similar photos of President Obama. Would any poster featuring President Obama be subject to copyright? You know what, that is an excellent question. Number one, this picture was taken before he was president. There is an exception if you're taking a picture of a public uh, representative. It turns out they know it was the photograph because they did an overlay exactly the same picture in the same position and there's no differences. And that's an issue that comes up a lot. So if I'm looking at someone and I'm going after someone for copyright infringement, I may actually do two copies of the, of the first the original work and then the derivative work and I see if they line up. There are exceptions to this. Believe it or not, the, um, um, if you go to Paris, you have the Eiffel Tower. It's almost impossible to tell if the Eiffel Tower has been copied or not. First of all, it's not subject to copyright infringement, but France did get protection to the lighting design if you see it at night. But you see millions of pictures where people take it in about the same location. So in some situations, what they've done is they've looked to see how the clouds look. And if the clouds line up exactly, then that's a situation where again, there might be the possibility of infringement. Uh, let me go back here a little bit because there's been a lot of questions. So give me a second. Okay. What is the difference between plagiarism and copyright? Plagiarism is basically a direct copy of something. It's when you take a full sentence, you take a full paragraph, or even if you copy an entire paper and you treat it as if it's your own. What happens more often is derivative works where you see the original work and as an artisan, you tweak it in certain ways as requested by your customers. It's not directly a 100% copy, but it's taking the essence of the copyright for your own use and that can cause you issues. Uh, the next question is, uh, can a resin sports figure be copyrighted? That is a good question. I think the answer is probably yes. And if it's a sports figure or someone famous, again, you have the right of publicity issue. Uh, I'm gonna give you my email address in the last slide so you'll have that. Uh, next question is reprinting a tweet infringement. Yes, it can be an infringement, but if you're doing it like a retweet, that is probably more of a newsworthy type of a thing. You're not doing it for commercial gain. Um, so you're probably all right. But if you now take a tweet that is infamous and you start putting it on hundreds and hundreds of different t-shirts, for example, and you're doing it for commercial gain, you might have an issue with copyright infringement. Next question. If you use a material with a pre-printed logo, e.g. fabric with a sports team logo, a manufacturer, is that an infringement? That's an excellent question. If you get it from a reputable organization, they probably already have a license from the sports team or from the NFL or NBA so that they can resell that emblem to you. And you using it with your t-shirt design should not be a problem. The same thing is true for Disney and a lot of other organizations. The license fee has already been paid. So if you get, for example, an embroidery or you get an iron-on, from a reputable organization, you shouldn't have issues because they've already paid the license fee on your behalf and it's baked into the price of the item that you've purchased. How about family photos with more than one family member? That's a good question. Technically, you might have a right of publicity issue, but if you're doing it for a family reunion in a non-commercial way, you're probably protected. 
It's when you take a picture of someone making a fool of themselves or doing something really stupid and advertising that to embarrass them further, that's when you can run into a lot of issues with right to publicity. So that's more of a common sense type of an issue. Next question. If something is styled after another person's work, say a wall plaque, but you use specific names and a couple's name, would that be an infringement? You can definitely go to third party objects and items for inspiration, but create your own aha from it. So for example, you see someone has done a really nice job with a wooden plaque and how they uh, put some uh, embroidery fabric on it, how they put some heat transfer material on it, and basically has transformed that piece of wood into something that's more of a piece of artwork. And you take that concept, you're fine with doing that at least from trademarks and copyrights, you're not creating a derivative work. You might have an issue on the patent side, but probably not. Unless you look at the item, and I'll mention this to you, if you look at something and it has a patent number, you might wanna take a look at it, they've given you notice. But if you take something for inspiration, but you don't copy it, that's totally acceptable. Copyright protects the expression of the idea, not the idea itself. Next question, we get asked to put collegiate logos on Yeti mugs often. Sometimes they ask us to change the logo a little to avoid copyright issues, but you're still uncomfortable. You should be. It is a potential issue. From a business risk standpoint, you may take the position if you do a one-off, it's not a problem, but if you're doing it all the time, you, you may run into issues. There's a lot of money to be made by these uh, universities, and they are sometimes very aggressive about protecting their trademarks and also their copyrights, so be careful. Pragmatic answer, not a legal answer, is if you do it one or two times, or you do it for a small group of people, you might be okay. But if you do it for an entire fraternity or in sorority that are on the campus, you might have a problem. So be careful about that. Is there a quick check that we can do to see if an image is protected or not? That's a really good question. There are some special search services out there. One of the best ones I would recommend using is what I would call Google reverse image searching. But I would be careful about that. I would put the burden on your customers instead of you doing all this yourself. They have better information than you do. And if you start to go down too far down that pathway, you could be getting yourself in some trouble. I think the better thing is to put the burden on your customers unless you really know that it's a problem. Um, but anyway, there are some really good reverse image lookups and one of them is Google's and that's for free. And there are paid ones, and the paid ones are very, very good about this, and, and they're very powerful. So if you do do a copyright or trademark infringement, be careful about putting it on your Facebook page and on your website, because these types of scours of the internet may very well find it, and you may not get the infringement because you did it, but you advertise that you did it as an example of your work. Be very careful about that. Next question. When we design coins for customers, we add our business name as a maker's mark on the edge of the coin. On occasion, we have pushback from the customer. I know it's not a trademark, but you can talk about maker's mark. Uh, I encourage it because it is showing that you're an artisan and that it is identified with you. And then if someone plagiarizes it later, you're able to show that it originated with you. I think maker marks are appropriate. And I can also understand why your customers give you pushback. It's an ultimately a business decision, but you often are creating some amazing work products and, and just creative artistic things. And I think it's appropriate to celebrate your creativity. So I'm in favor of it, but I understand the issue of pushback. Next question. If a customer asks us to print logos on a product that we source out to someone else to print, who's responsible for the fines? My flippant answer is going to be whoever has the money. So you would have potential responsibility, and the third party vendor you use could also have potential responsibility. Uh, if you look at the artisan agreement, if you send, a, send me your information, I'll send it to you. I protect both you and your subcontractor because the reality is that you can't do everything your, yourself, and you'll bring in other artisans to help you, and it's the goal is to protect all of you. Uh, someone asked for a copy of the presentation. A copy of the presentation will be provided in PDF format uh, after we're done today. Next question. The city orders a recognition plaque for company X and wants to use X's logo. Well, that's a really good question. The, can the company allow that? If you're doing it for the company itself and you're using their logo and they're the recipient of it, 
I'm going to argue that there's really not going to be a copyright or trademark issue because it's not leaving the sphere. Um, you, I think you're going to be okay if you're doing the logo and you're doing the brand for the entity actually receiving it, such as an award. I think you're probably okay. Next question. It seems to me that if a local club or organization comes to me to include their logo on a one-off plaque, I should be able to reproduce this at their request. I'm not reproducing these items in mass quantities to resale for general profit. That's a pragmatic response. It, it's not the right legal answer, but I think it may be a reasonable business for us to do a one-off like that. Um, you wanna be careful about it. I can tell you right now, Rotary is very aggressive about it. I can tell you the Toastmasters at times is very aggressive about it. But I will also uh, acknowledge that these organizations will allow an artisan like you to do something unique if it's not within their wheelhouse of things that they're usually created. Uh, I'm aware, for example, that Toastmasters may allow you to do a great gavel as an engraving type of thing because they don't sell it. But don't do Toastmaster name tags, that would be an issue. So again, use common sense. And ultimately, it's a business risk. Any comments on the NCAA college players like and likeness? Yeah, it's gonna make lawyers like me a lot of money. And I think you as artisans are gonna have challenges with it. And I think it's gonna be really an expansion of the right of publicity. So I think that's gonna be a, a real area uh, of growth um, in potential litigation. Next question. If we sell a name badge with a company logo to the company itself, do we need anything writing giving us permission? What if we sell that same badge to a reseller who sells it to the company? Well, let me give you a reality check. If they are a franchisee, like a pizza company, thing like that, they may not actually have the rights to the logo or to the brand. So be careful about that. But if it's a local company and you are dealing with the owners of it and you're doing the name tags for them, you're probably okay. But be careful if you're dealing with a national company, they have a lot of quality control provisions in their documents with their franchisees and with their subs and related organizations, and you can get them to yourself in trouble. Again, under that situation, I would put the burden to get permission. Uh, following up on that same question, if you uh, have that badge and you can do it to a reseller, again, you can be hit for copyright, trademark, infringement, or the like, so be careful. Next question, back to the licensing of a sport logo, for instance, fabric purchased from a craft store typically has a not for resale statement attached. In this case, my assumption is it's not valid to make into something and then resell it. We're probably out of my area of expertise, but my feeling, and this is me as an individual, if you bought that particular patch and you put it on a shirt, well, why did you buy that patch? Um, it seems to me that you should be able to use the patch despite what they said, but I can see arguments the other way, so I'd be careful about that. But I would rather have you showing that you bought the patch and that you used it appropriately than to not have any permission from anyone at all and to make it from scratch. Again, there's risks associated with it. If they tell you in the, in the materials not to resell and use that patch for another reason, it's only for your personal use. There are potential issues, that's a contract thing. Um, but I think that would be more of a contract issue than necessarily a copyright and trademark, so long as that they have a license. So be careful, but I think you at least have some better defenses. Uh, let's see, one or two more questions, and I think we'll be done. Let's see here. Um, what about items that say patent pending? What does that mean? That means that they have filed for patent protection. They may not have it yet. And if they do get a patent, it may cover their actual product that's selling. They're basically putting you on notice that they have filed for patent protection. But until they actually have a patent, they can't enforce it. And can you explain indemnification again? Yes. Indemnification means that you put the burden on someone else to protect you if you're later charged with infringement. Your customer has better information than you do about what you're being asked to do. They know about the brands, they know if they have a license, if they're associated with an organization. They're asking you to create something according to an order and they typically have better information than you do. If something goes wrong, they should pay for the mistake. 
and that's the purpose of indemnification. You're just doing what you've been told to do. Since they have the information, they should protect you. That's what indemnification is. Okay, next question. How can the military, such as the Marine Corps, go after com companies who produce logo products on behalf of uh, members of the military? Uh, even though they're part of the federal government, they do have trademark protection for different parts of the government, and they can assert that trademark protection. Um, you, there's a lot of money to be made for advertising with the armed forces and recruiting, so there are potential issues, and you want to be careful about that. Okay, let's do one more question. If I take a famous football play and animate the players, remove the team logos and player numbers, as well as add something to change the original outcome, could this be a violation? The answer is possibly it could be a derivative work. Uh, but if you're just taking the basic concept of a play and you're basically creating your own things from scratch and using it for inspiration, I would argue that's transformative and not an issue. But if I look at the uh, thing and I merely think of the famous play and I associate with it, and if I were to line up on a frame by frame basis and I see that there's an overlap, you probably have an issue. Okay, uh, maybe one more question. If we take a picture of a famous stadium, such as the Kauffman Stadium for the Kansas City Royals, and I know the photographer who wants to reproduce it on items or sell, am I at risk? You might be at risk if it's a famous stadium and things like that. That it comes up actually on a fairly regular basis. I think some more research would be required about that. But if it's more a part of a streetscape, you probably have fewer issues. But if you're focusing specifically on a famous building, um, there might be some issues. And I think uh, there should be uh, some additional research that would be required. There is at least some risk. OK, that's all I have. Uh, any questions from the organizers or anything else I can do for you? Nope, I think that's good, Michael. Um, thank you again, and thank you all for joining us for today's webinar hosted by the Awards and Personalization Association. Um, for more information on upcoming webinars, please visit awardspersonalization.org or email info at awardspersonalization.org. Um, and there we have that uh, final slide there with Michael's email. So if you do want to reach out to him about that um, document, you can go ahead and do that there. And again, the handouts will be available um, after the presentation is over, and this recording um, will be posted onto the website uh, soon. And thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone, and appreciate the opportunity. Bye-bye, everybody.